I covered the worst free agent contracts and free agent extensions previously. Now it's time to look at the worst arbitration extensions. Now these deals tend to have a lot less money involved than those free agent deals, so the risk isn't nearly as high for a disastrous contract, but there are some that do not work out at all. It can be due to injury, but sometimes it can just be ineffectiveness on the player's part. So we're going to count them down. Coming up, the 20 worst arbitration extensions in baseball history after the intro. The methodology for this list is going to be the exact same as it was in the best arbitration extensions video, which I broke down in detail how I put these lists together. You can check out that video for an in-depth explanation, but to spare you the five minutes, I'll give you a very brief explanation here. I'm only looking at completed contracts, comparing any arbitration years bought out by the extension by looking at what they got paid versus what they hypothetically would have been paid in arbitration if they hadn't signed the extension, and any free agent years I compare their production and salary versus the average cost of that production in free agency. With that, I get a net value of the contract versus expected. Positive number good, negative number bad. This list is the 20 largest negative numbers, starting with number 20. Dontrell Willis's three-year deal with the Tigers in 2008 coming in at negative $39.6 million. When I talked about the best arbitration extensions, Miguel Cabrera made the list with the Tigers, and I made a joke about teams constantly trading for Marlins players and then giving them extensions immediately. But the players I showed were just scratching the surface, as I didn't even include another player that went to the Marlins to the Tigers in the exact same trade as Cabrera, and was also immediately extended. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. Probably because that player is Dontrell Willis, and his extension didn't go that well. For the first two years of the contract, Willis pitched more in the minors than in the majors, but that's probably because he had an 827 ERA and a walk rate of almost 10 walks per nine innings pitched. Something was wrong with Willis, as the Rookie of the Year winner in 2003 and Cy Young runner-up in 2005 had somehow forgotten how to pitch. Year three of this contract didn't get much better, and finally the Tigers had had enough and designated him for assignment in June. Tigers beat writer John Lowe of the Detroit Free Press wrote, unless he gets traded or claimed, both scenarios seem unlikely, the Tigers will release him. That's usually not a good sign. But somehow, the Tigers found a trade partner in the Arizona Diamondbacks and paid a large amount of money remaining on Willis's contract just so Arizona could take him off their hands. He had a 6.85 ERA in Arizona and was released just over a month after the trade. He did have one final year in the majors, signing with the Reds, and showed improvement from his years with the Tigers and Diamondbacks as he came this close to having an ERA under 5. The saving grace of this deal is that it was only three years. If it was any longer, it would have been much higher on this list. Number 19, Preston Wilson's five-year deal with the Marlins in 2001, coming in at negative $40.5 million. Hey, we have proof with this contract that sometimes the Marlins do extend their players, and then trade them before even half the deal is up. Since 1999, the Marlins have signed nine arbitration extensions, and only one, Alex Gonzalez, wasn't traded before the end of the deal. What's even weirder is how these trades netted out for the Marlins. The three players traded before December 1, 2005, Cliff Floyd, Preston Wilson, and Mike Lowell, all netted positive net war for the Marlins in the deals, while the five players traded after December 1, 2005, Paul LaDuca, Hanley Ramirez, Josh Johnson, Ricky Nolasco, and Christian Yelich, all netted negative net war. The reason the Preston Wilson trade netted out positive wasn't because they got an amazing return. They did get three years of Juan Pierre, which isn't bad, but mostly because Preston Wilson was very bad the last two years of the contract. Wilson was a very promising young player, putting up 31 home runs in 2000 at the age of 25, and the Marlins extended him for five years during spring training in 2001. The first two years of the contract as a Marlin, he wasn't bad, but he didn't improve on his 2000 season. After 2002, he was traded to the Rockies, and you could say his 2003 was the best season of his career, with 36 home runs and 141 RBIs, and he got some MVP votes. But I do think this is an instance where his numbers were aided by Coors Field and hitting behind a 458 on on-base percentage Todd Helton, because while his counting stats were great, his rate and adjusted stats paint the picture of a slightly above-average player. 
But while he was slightly above average in 2003, 2004, and 2005 were not good. Wilson had a knee injury that limited him to 58 games in 2004, but he still wasn't good when he did play, accumulating negative 1.1 war in those 58 games. And 2005 wasn't much better as he was one of the worst defenders in the league and put up a sub-800 OPS while playing a third of his games in course. That was pretty much lights out for his career as he only played parts of two more seasons in the majors, signing with the Astros prior to 2006, but later getting cut in August, and then signing with the Cardinals where he only played 58 more games. Number 18, Dan Petrie's four-year deal with the Tigers in 1984 coming in at negative $40.9 million. It might shock people that this contract made the list because in 1984 and 1985, the first two years of the contract, Petrie was pretty darn good. He finished fifth in the Cy Young in 1984 and was an all-star selection in 1985. However, the goal of arbitration extensions from a team standpoint is to buy out free agent years, which are much more important in the analysis I'm doing. The Tigers would have had Petrie in 84 and 85 regardless of this extension. The primary goal of the extension was to buy out 86 and 87. And if you look at 86 and 87 and only view his ERA, it wasn't terrible at 4.66 and 5.61 respectively, but he was the king of unearned runs with 35 total in those two seasons. His run against per nine, which includes unearned runs, was 6.43, giving him minus 2.6 wins above replacement in 250.2 innings, according to baseball reference, which tanked the value of this contract. But this isn't the only interesting contract in Petrie's career. He re-signed with the Tigers for a one-year deal in 1990. And with how free agency worked at the time, for 1991, the Tigers were able to offer Petrie arbitration to potentially get draft pick compensation. Petrie accepted arbitration, thinking he could secure a two-year deal with the Tigers or even win an arbitration. This is noteworthy because it's the biggest gap in arbitration filings I've ever seen, with the Tigers filing $650,000 and Petrie filing $1.35 million. I've never seen a player file more than double what the team filed. The problem is Petrie was not good the previous five seasons, accumulating a total of minus 0.8 war. Him asking for $1.35 million was close to double the league average salary at the time and 13 times the league minimum. It'd be like a player that's been below replacement for five years asking for $9 million today. Petrie did not win his arbitration case, didn't get his two-year contract, and his near 5 ERA in 1991 made it so it was his last year pitching in the majors. A pretty bad end of a career for a player who was pretty good in his early 20s. Number 17, Dennis Martinez's five-year deal with the Orioles in 1982, coming in at negative $44.3 million. Martinez is the rare example of a player who was downright bad during his five-year arbitration extension, putting up an ERA of 4.86 and a cumulative war of 0.3 during the contract, but rebounded incredibly well in his age 33 and older seasons. After being traded to the Expos in the last year of his contract, he signed a league minimum free agent extension with the Expos for 1987. From 1987 to 1995, his ages 33 to 41 seasons, he had a 3.02 ERA, four All-Star appearances, Cy Young and MVP votes in 1991 where he led the league in ERA, and a total of 39.8 war in those nine years, an average of 4.42 per season. He even threw a perfect game in 1991. What's the explanation for this? How could a player be terrible his age 29 to 32 seasons, but be so great ages 33 to 41? One possibility is his recovery from alcoholism. One story I ran across is he received a DWI in 1980 after a police officer in a bar parking lot said he was too drunk to drive, drove him home, and Martinez proceeded to get into another car right away to drive back to the bar to pick up his other car. I really don't know how the logistics work on that one. And the cop arrested him right away. His drinking habits led to his demotion to the bullpen in 1983, as well as the Orioles leaving him off the playoff roster that year. While he realized he had a problem and went sober prior to the 1984 season, his numbers didn't rebound until 1987. It's an interesting hypothetical. If he didn't have his alcohol problems with the Orioles and pitching like crap for five years of his prime, could Martinez have been a Hall of Famer? Number 16, Vinny Castilla's four-year deal with the Rockies in 1998, coming in at negative $44.9 million. Castilla is another example of a player who was still good for the original team control year of his extension. 
hitting 46 home runs, making the all-star team, winning a silver slugger, receiving MVP votes, and putting up a career-best 5.6 war. But the three free agent years bought out with this extension were dreadful. 79 OPS plus, only a 306 on base percentage. A trade of the Rays after 1999, where he ended up playing in only 85 games in 2000 due to injuries. While he wasn't making close to Albert Bell or Alex Rodriguez's salary at the time, he was still one of the higher paid players in the league during this rough stretch. He played five more seasons in the majors at the conclusion of this contract, mostly with poor results minus his 2004 where he had a glimmer of returning to form, but not all is bad for Castilla. He's the all-time home run leader among Mexican-born players, getting induced into the Mexican Professional Baseball Hall of Fame in 2020, and he was the last player to retire among the original 1993 Expansion Rockies roster. Number 15, Ron Davis' four-year deal with the Twins in 1984, coming at $45.1 million. Davis was an all-star closer for the Yankees in 1981, before being traded to the Twins at the beginning of 1982. In 1984, after two solid years out of the bullpen with the Twins and two team control years remaining, the Twins decided to extend him for four years, buying out two free agent years. Davis was okay his two original team control years, putting up a 4.08 ERA with 54 saves. And things started fine in 1986 with two clean saves to start the season. But those would be the last two saves of his career. Davis seemingly forgot how to pitch, putting up an over 9 ERA in 38.2 innings with the Twins before getting traded to the Cubs and continuing his poor pitching with a 7.65 ERA in 20 additional innings. Things didn't get much better with him putting up a 5.84 ERA with the Cubs in 1987 before getting released. He pitched a small number of innings for the Dodgers and the Giants for the rest of 1987 and in 1988, but the results didn't get much better and he was out of the league after the 1988 season. Not a good showing for one of the highest paid relievers in the league. Number 14, Justin Morneau's six-year deal with the Twins in 2008 coming in at negative $45.8 million. Back-to-back twins, what you could call a twin killing. Oh, God. But Morneau is a bit of a surprise inclusion, and a few Twins brands are probably having a negative reaction to him being on the list right now. He was great the first two and a half years of this contract, finishing second in the MVP voting in 2008 and making the All-Star team in 2008, 9, and 10. However, those three years were the three arbitration years of this contract, and what he was paid during that time was probably very close to what he would have made in arbitration, meaning not a lot of monetary positive value for the Twins. He suffered a concussion and missed the entire second half of 2010, leading into the three free agent years bought out with the extension. For those free agent years, where Morneau was a top 30 paid player in the league, his production dipped hard. 2008 to 2010, he put up 12.4 war. 2011 to 2013, he only put up 1.4. 2011 was probably the worst year of his career only played in 69 games due to injury, and when he did play, he put up a paltry 6.18 OPS with only four home runs. The Twins ended up trading to the Pirates for the last month of 2013 to close out this contract. Morneau is still a fan favorite in Minnesota with his MVP win in 2006, and his dip in production was due to some very unfortunate injuries that Twins fans don't hold against him. I have to believe that if he remained healthy, this contract would have finished up well on the positive side. Unfortunately, he was very highly paid for some injury-plagued seasons. Number 13, Matt Harrison's five-year deal with the Rangers in 2013, coming in at negative $47.2 million. Matt Harrison is about the worst injury timing you can get. After making the All-Star team and getting Cy Young votes in 2012, and with two team control years remaining, the Rangers decided to lock him up for five years. He threw 213.1 innings in 2012. He threw 44 innings the rest of his career. It started with back stiffness in 2013, which led to surgery for a herniated disc, which progressed to spinal fusion surgery in 2014. The constant pain was too much for him and forced him to retire during the 2016 season. Luckily for the Rangers, they were able to unload his contract to the Phillies in 2015 as part of a deal that brought Cole Hamels to Texas. If anything, this extension illustrates some of the security an arbitration extension can give a player, even if it's normally an underpay for their free agent years. Harrison made $50 million from 2014 to 2018, where if he was still under normal year-to-year arbitration and had these injuries, that number probably would have been closer to $10 million. Number 12, Jermaine Dye's three-year deal with the Athletics in 2002, coming in at negative $47.5 million. 
Jermaine Dye was a key player on the 2002 Moneyball A's and only got one name drop the entire movie. You want Dye and Wright? He takes the cake as probably being Billy Bean's worst transaction in that 2002 season. Entering his last team control year, the A's gave Dye a three-year extension, buying out two free agent years. Dye was the highest paid player in Oakland for the entirety of his contract. While Dye was okay in 2002, but still nowhere close to how the highest paid player on the team should produce, 2003 was a disaster. He missed the majority of the year with knee and shoulder injuries, but when he was on the field, the results were ugly. 172 batting average, 514 OPS, and a whopping negative 1.8 war in 65 games. A 162 game pace of minus 4.5 war. 2004 was a bit of a bounce back similar to 2002 numbers, but again, nowhere near how you'd expect the highest paid player on a team to produce. This isn't the end of Dye's story though. He signed a free agent deal with the White Sox in 2005 at a significant pay decrease compared to what he was making with Oakland and had a career resurgence winning World Series MVP his first year in Chicago, getting a ring and having arguably his best career season in 2006 with an OPS over 1000, finishing fifth in the MVP vote. Those three years in Oakland under this extension lined up perfectly with the worst three year stretch in Dye's career. Number 11, Carlos Martinez's five-year deal with the Cardinals in 2017, coming at negative $48.6 million. This 2015 All-Star pitcher signed a five-year deal going into 2017 that bought out two free agent years, and it started out well with an All-Star appearance in the first year of the contract, finishing with a 3.64 ERA in 205 innings. 2018 also started off promising, carrying a 1.43 ERA in April. But in early May, he hit the injured list with a right lat strain. He hit the injured list again later in the year with an oblique strain and was moved to the bullpen to try to help with his health when he returned. He stayed in the bullpen, taking over the closer role in 2019, but again, missed some time due to injury. For the two free agent years the Cardinals bought out, they decided to move Martinez back to the rotation, but the injuries piled up and he only made five starts in 2020, racking up a 990 ERA. He had 16 starts in 2021 with a 6.23 ERA, but a torn thumb ligament cut his season short. The Cardinals declined Martinez's option into 2022, making him a free agent. He signed with the Giants and then the Red Sox on minor league deals, but was released from both, and then got hit with an 80-game suspension for testing positive for Ibutamorin, and once that was up, he was suspended again for violating the league's joint domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse policy. He never pitched in the majors again instead going to the Mexican leagues where he's had an ERA over six cents. Number 10, John Danks' five-year deal with the White Sox in 2012 coming in at negative $50 million. Danks had been a solid pitcher for the White Sox, putting up a 112 ERA plus in 917 innings in five years. Going into his last year of arbitration, the White Sox decided to extend him for five years at around $15 million a year. While Danks did have some trips to the IL early into this extension, his career wasn't completely derailed by injuries like a lot of the other players on this list. He still threw 585 innings during this contract, but was plagued by ineffectiveness with a 4.92 ERA, equal to an 81 ERA plus at the time. While he put up 6.4 war in 2008, from 2012 to 2016, the duration of this contract, he only put up 0.6. After having a 7.25 ERA in early 2016, the White Sox had seen enough and designated him for assignment after only four starts. He signed with the Braves in the offseason, but was released at the end of spring training and retired after that. Number 9. Jeremy Bonnerman's four-year contract with the Tigers in 2007, coming in at negative $51 million. Bonderman was a solid, but not spectacular, starting pitcher his first four years with the Tigers, putting up close to a league average 4.72 ERA in that time. But he was an innings eater for them, throwing 214 innings in 2006, and showed potential for improvement. The Tigers gave him a four-year extension, buying out two free agent years, hoping at a minimum he'd still be a workhorse, but with hopes he could improve. And things started out great. He opened the first half of 2007 with a 3.48 ERA, just missing the All-Star team, finishing second in the final fan vote. But after the break, the wheels fell off. He had a 7.38 ERA in 12 starts in the second half, missed most of 2008 due to a blood clot, and only threw 10 innings in 2009 due to pain in his pitching shoulder. The good news in 2010 was he was healthy, starting 29 games for the first time since 2006. 
but the bad news is he was ineffective with a 5.53 ERA. He remained unsigned for the 2011 and 2012 seasons and was looking like he was destined for retirement. However, the Mariners took a flyer on him for 2013, but he was designated for assignment halfway through the season. He signed a minor league deal with the Tigers after that and did make a few appearances for them towards the end of the season. He retired after 2013. Number 8, Dan Uglis' five-year deal with the Braves in 2011 coming in at negative $51.2 million. I gotta admit, I'm a Dan Ugla fan. He's the kind of player that drives traditional fans mad with his low batting averages and high strikeout rates, but the guy had crazy power for a second baseman, having five consecutive seasons with over 30 home runs, an MLB record. While Ugla was never a high average guy, he did manage 287 in 2010 with the Marlins. And the Marlins tried to extend him, but Ugla turned down their four-year, $48 million contract offer, prompting a trade to the Braves who signed him to a five-year, $62 million contract, buying out four free agent years. 2011 started off dreadful as he had a 173 batting average and a 568 OPS by early July. But what did he do next? Well, what's the one thing you'd expect a guy hitting 173 to do? Go on a 33-game hit streak, of course. From July 5th to August 13th, Ugla got a hit in every game he played in, raising his batting average from 173 to a robust 232. His hit streak is the longest in the league in the last 13 years, truly one of the oddest things to happen in baseball. But even with that hit streak, Ugla had a dreadful 206 batting average during this extension. His power also suffered going from a perennial 30-plus home run hitter to having a high of 22 after 2011. It got so bad in 2013 that even though Uglo was a full-time starter in the regular season, the Braves left him off their playoff roster. Even with a year and a half left on his contract, the Braves opted to release him in July of 2014. He had a four-game stint with the Giants to close out the year that earned him a World Series ring, of all things, and played some with the Nationals the next season. But without his dreadful batting average improving, he retired at the end of 2015. Number 7. Ricky Weeks' four-year deal with the Brewers in 2011, coming in at negative $51.8 million. Speaking of players that frustrate traditional fans, for years, Brewers fans had a love-hate relationship with Weeks. A common saying was you can't spell Ricky Weeks without a few E's and a couple K's. He had the highest batting average in NCAA history when he was drafted with the second overall pick in 2003 out of Southern University. But Weeks turned out not to be that high average player once he made the majors. He struck out at a very high clip and had some of the worst defense in the league at second base. But he was still very good at getting on base and hit for a good chunk of power for a middle infielder. Even though he only had a 253 batting average his first seven seasons with the Brewers, he had a very nice 355 on base percentage and close to 30 home run power when he stayed healthy, which always seemed to be an issue with Weeks. Even though he had shown flashes in the past, 2010 was the first year he really put it all together, as well as stayed healthy the entire year, and going into his last year of free agency, the Brewers extended him for four years. Things were looking good the first year of the contract as Weeks hit 278 with 17 home runs before the All-Star break and made his first All-Star team. However, an ankle injury forced him to miss time the second half. That 278 batting average turned to 229, and those 17 home runs turned into three in the second half. Things will get worse over the next three years as injuries piled up, and the frustrating aspects of Weeks' game, the strikeouts and terrible defense, got even worse. His minus 2.7 D war in 2012 was a career worst, and he hit 233 over those three years. The Brewers declined Weeks' option for 2015, and over the next three years, he played with the Mariners, Diamondbacks, and Rays, but the results weren't much better, and he retired after 2017. Number 6, Carlos Baerga's four-year deal with Cleveland in 1995 coming in at negative $53.9 million. I don't know how he does it, but Carlos Baerga is a name that keeps coming up in my videos. From discussing his cameo in Little Big League to having his name pop up on the positive side of the most lopsided trades in baseball history. This time he comes up under not so great circumstances though. Baerga played a role in making the Joe Carter trade net extremely well for Cleveland in his team control years, making three All-Star games, winning two Silver Sluggers, and receiving MVP votes in two different seasons. But that production disappeared once the three free agent years of this extension kicked in. He put up just a 78 OPS plus in those years, prompting Cleveland to trade him to the Mets for Jeff Kent and Jose Vizcaino in 1996. A trade that probably would have been another lopsided trade in favor of Cleveland if they didn't quickly flip Kent and Vizcaino to the Giants for Matt Williams. Baerga's play didn't improve in New York, and they let him go to free agency after 1998. 
1999 was an eventful year for Baerga as he was cut by both the Cardinals and the Reds before he found a home in San Diego for two months before he was purchased back by Cleveland. In 2000, injuries piled up and he was unable to play the entire season. Played in Korea in 2001 and returned to the majors in 2002 playing for the Red Sox, Diamondbacks, and Nationals before retiring after 2005. Number 5. Mike Lansing's four-year deal with the Rockies in 1998 coming in at negative $55.1 million. Lansing was an average to above average middle infielder his first five years with the Expos. Coming off his best season and going into his last team control year, the Expos decided to trade him to the Rockies, who inked him to a four-year extension before the 1998 season. And Lansing pulled off the impossible. He went to pre-humidor Coors Field in 1998 in the height of the steroid era, the best offensive stadium in the best offensive era where people were putting up silly power numbers. And he actually put up way worse numbers than he did in Montreal. To make things even worse, when the Mitchell Report came out in 2007, it was confirmed that Lansing had purchased testosterone and human growth hormone during his time in Colorado. I can't even begin to understand how it's possible that someone goes to Coors Field in the late 90s while juicing and they see their offensive numbers drop this significantly. After two and a half pretty bad years in Colorado, the Rockies traded Lansing to the Red Sox and his numbers got even worse. At the end of the contract, he ended up signing a minor league deal with Cleveland, but only played in AAA and never made it back to the majors. He retired after 2002. Number four. Aaron Hicks' eight-year deal with the Yankees in 2019 coming in at negative $70.8 million. I've always felt a bit bad for Hicks because it's one thing to perform poorly during an extension, but it's a completely different thing to do so while playing for the Yankees. In the past five years, I don't think there's been another player out there that's been publicly raked through the coals by their fan base due to poor play as much as Hicks. And Hicks was very good prior to this extension, getting MVP votes in 2018. Unfortunately, after signing the extension, Hicks required Tommy John surgery missing a large portion of 2019. 2020 saw the pandemic shortened season where he had decent results in only 54 games, but in 2021 he required surgery to repair a torn tendon sheath in his wrist and only appeared in 32 games. 2022 was really his first healthy full season after signing this extension, and according to the numbers, he was slightly below average. But people are going to focus on that 216 batting average, and the Boo Birds started coming out. Swing and a miss, down on strikes. And he is hearing it from the crowd. Hicks was benched going into 2023 and only played in 28 games for the Yankees, hitting 188 and getting outright released in late May with almost three years remaining on the contract. What's poetic, though, is Baltimore signed him to fill a hole, and Hicks proceeded to have the best batting average and OPS plus in his career in his 65 games with them. He even had a 1.025 OPS in the playoffs for the Orioles, leading the team in championship win probability added during their three-game series against the Rangers. He's currently a free agent, and I'm willing to bet with this strong showing to end the year, paired with whatever team signed him only needing to pay the league minimum due to the Yankees still owing him $10 million a year, some team is going to snatch him up soon. Probably after I write and record this line, but before I finish the video. So I'll cover my back and say Aaron Hicks signed with the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Number 3. Cecil Fielder's 5-year deal with the Tigers in 1993 coming in at negative $94.8 million. Like father, like son. The similarities between the careers of Prince Fielder and Cecil Fielder don't stop with them both having 319 career home runs, or both reaching the 50 home run club once, but both signed what turned out to be disastrous contracts for the Tigers. Prince made my list of the worst free agent contracts, but to be fair to him, it was injury prematurely ending his career that made that contract so bad. And in fairness to the Tigers, they did trade Prince before all that happened, getting a very good Ian Kinsler in return. Cecil, on the other hand, made this list because his contract made him the highest paid player in the league in both 1995 and 1996. But his production was way down from his peak years that got him that contract in the first place. You may look at his numbers and say, that doesn't look too terrible. He's still hitting over 30 home runs most of those years. But remember, this is a guy getting paid the most any player had ever been paid in MLB history up to that point based off of when he was hitting 40 to 50 home runs a year. And this is in the middle of the steroid era where other first basemen were putting up ridiculous numbers. 
Fielder had a 139 OPS plus the three seasons prior to this extension. And you could make a good argument that what the Tigers signed him for would be overpaying him for that production. But during the five years of this extension, his OPS plus dropped to 112. Fielder was traded to the Yankees with a year and a half remaining on this contract, and his play continued to slide with 1997 being the worst season of his career up to that point. What's really telling is Fielder made $9.2 million the last year of this extension. He was signed by the Angels in free agency on a one-year deal at only $2.8 million and was released before the end of the season. Number two, Homer Bailey's six-year deal with the Reds in 2014 coming in at negative $115.9 million. I want to give some perspective here. Adam Wainwright, who finished top three in the Cy Young voting three times prior to 2014, signed a five-year extension with the Cardinals, giving him an average AAV of $19.5 million. Homer Bailey, who was maybe a league average pitcher trending in the right direction with an okay 2012 and a solid 2013, was given a six-year deal with an average AAV of $16.6 million. Apparently, getting two no-hitters raises your stock when it comes to contracts. Going back to a thread on Reddit when Bailey's extension was announced was filled with a lot of neutral fans going, that seems like a bit of an overpay, and a lot of Reds fans saying, no, 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 you don't understand. He's trending up. He's gonna be great. Someone even commented, in this thread, a lot of optimistic Reds fans. Not only was it an overpay for where Homer Bailey was in his career at the time, even if you think his stock was trending up, that's not what happened. Bailey had injuries hit starting in the second half of 2014 that limited him to under 110 innings for the next four years. And when he did pitch, the results were not good. An over six ERA for three consecutive seasons. A miserable 2018 where he had a 1-18 record while taking up 20% of the team's payroll. He was traded to the Dodgers prior to 2019, along with two prospects, to bring in four veterans to the Reds to try to complete a rebuild and compete in 2019 which failed miserably as the four veterans, Kyle Farmer, Yasiel Puig, Alex Wood, and a player I'll name in a minute as he's number one on this list, combined for negative 0.7 war with the Reds in 2019. Bailey didn't even get a chance to play for the Dodgers as he was released the day after the trade. One of the largest extensions in Reds history ended up being a salary balancing piece in a trade. The next two years saw Bailey play with the Royals, A's, and Twins, retiring after the 2020 season. Number one, Matt Kemp's eight-year deal with the Dodgers in 2012, coming in at negative $122.5 million. Yes, Matt Kemp was the fourth player the Reds received in that Homer Bailey trade. But unlike Homer Bailey, you could say Kemp may have been worth the extension at the time it was signed. He was coming off an incredible 2011 where he put up eight war and 172 OPS+, plus, finishing second in the MVP. And arguably he should have finished first, but as a Brewers fan, I'm not going to touch that MVP vote with a 10-foot pole. Going into his age 27 season, coming off one of the best performances in the 2010s, it looked like Kemp was going to be a star for the next five years at a minimum. And the Dodgers struck while his stock was up, giving him an eight-year extension. Kemp put up eight war in 2011 alone. He put up 4.3 war during the eight years of this extension. The first two years of the contract were plagued by injuries. Hamstring strain in early 2012, later in the year a knee and shoulder injury after running into a wall that required surgery to repair a torn labrum and damage to his rotator cuff, hamstring strain in 2013, pain in a surgically repaired shoulder, and an ankle sprain limited to under 110 games for both seasons. And when he did play, the results weren't close to his amazing 2011. He was fully healthy 2014 to 2016, playing in over 150 games each season. But the injuries had already made his mediocre defense become an extreme liability. He rated as the fourth worst defensive left fielder in the league in these three years, racking up 21.5 defensive runs below average. But the problem there is he only played 25% of his games in left field in that time. The other 75% were in right field where he racked up a crazy 40.6 defensive runs below average for a combined total of over 60 defensive runs below average in the outfield in only three years. His offensive numbers were decent during this time, but nowhere close to what he was in 2011. The Dodgers had seen enough, and from 2014 to 2019, it seemed like teams were playing hot potato with Kemp's contract as he was traded to the Padres, then traded to the Braves, traded back to the Dodgers, and finally traded to the Reds where he was released only two months into the 2019 season. The next year and a half, he played with the Mets, Marlins, and Rockies before retiring after 2020. 